shirt sleeves you know it's it's uh yeah it's great it's good for your mental health isn't it yeah also i'm weak you know uh like <laughs> are you not, i'm physically not strong so it's good <laughs> to not have to be like freezing cold all the time yeah so is that your studio that you're in uh-huh yeah um is it book hell yeah drawing me <laughs> Did you do that painting back there? Uh, that one of my grandmother? Yeah. Uh, no, that was like, uh, it's like a, um, oh, sorry, I'll, I'll show you. It's, oh, wow. That. Um, so that's uh, um, my, these are my father's parents. Uh, that's like, uh, the blue painting is kind of a self-portrait of, of my granddad, who's like a Sunday painter. And the other one, I think they, like they commissioned it from, you know, like someone when they were like visiting Florida. Mm. My grandmother was like a blonde for a year or two, I think in the 1950s and, and she was really feeling glamorous. So they like had like this sort of glamorous painting done. I love it, I've always loved it. When I saw it, I was like, who is that lady? And they're like, she's like, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm in like East Hollywood. So I don't know, that's kind of fun. Have you done, you've shared studio space with people before? Uh, no, I haven't. It's great i've only done it i mean you do it when you're in school but i did it um for a couple of years in san francisco uh with uh my buddy matt's who like i make stickers with still yeah. and uh and then another guy but we did it for like a couple of years and the first year i learned so much just from being in a room with other artists it mm -hmm. like you just it was more valuable than a lot of like school experience you know just just being there you know, when they're working through projects and you're like, oh, that's, you know, just observing how people work or, yeah. having, you know, being able to bounce ideas. And I mean, God, I learned so much. And then the second year was like having roommates and it kind of sucked, but yeah. um, there should be like a rotating thing where you can like rotate people in and out. A lot of the books that you had done, because you've done a lot of books, uh, I was like uh, looking up exactly how many books you had done. <laughs> and I think like, they're, they're all collections from Yikes. Is that true? Or is it, are they all, or some of them are... They're well, they're not here. all like no. I'm, I'm guessing oh, there must be like maybe five of those yikes things or something. I don't know. Uh, like I, I thought I had about ten books done, but maybe half of them are yikes ones. Mm -hmm. Like I haven't, I haven't done, you know, any yikes stuff in like ten years. So um, it seems pretty. It's so remote that uh, like it, you know, it's kind of like oh, I wonder what that would be like, you know, to do something, you know, like that. Yeah. Uh, but I think. Maybe there's like five of those. I don't know. Were you, you did you started Yikes when you were in college? Uh, after I started it, um, well, I like was kind of I had that title in mind for like when I was in school. Actually, I remember I, when I was in school, um, one of like my sort of projects was like a uh, like a self published anthology. Mm -hmm. And it was called Yikes, but it, it it was completely like not. It was just like uh, you know other students and people who knew people and everyone just kind of contributed. And I drew some comic that I don't even think I wrote. You know, it's just it was all it was kind of like. But so yeah, but I mean, it wasn't until after school um, that I had like that idea about the sort of monster kids, and I was like, oh, that fits with that same title too. Yeah, but were they, uh, was it a zine, like a mini comic at the time when you first started doing Yikes, or was it actually a comic book? Uh, the f yeah, it started as a, yeah, mini comic. Uh, the, I did like an issue, you know, with like, you know, print run of like 200, 250, something like that. Oh, okay. um, and it was like a, that was a mini comic, you know, whatever, uh, the half size, whatever, you know. Like eight and a half by five and a half or something? Yes. Yeah, and, and then was it in color? um offset printed cover so three color cover 
um, I knew a guy that worked at like a print shop. Uh, yeah. and it was great. Like he was really like helpful to me when I was just starting out because he like taught me how to do mechanical separations, mm -hmm. um, which I hadn't like I hadn't taken printmaking in school uh, at that point. Yeah, uh, interesting. Because no, I know no, I must have, but I hadn't worked with Ruby Lith. I think I'd done uh, printmaking, but I hadn't done that sort of like you know traditional um, mechanical color separations with Ruby Lith and all that stuff. And he showed me how to how it worked, and I loved it. And and started you know color separating a lot. Yeah, I, I don't know how I would have ever used Ruby Lith. It seems like such a nightmare to learn how to use that stuff. No, it's great. I don't know. I adored it. Uh, like I, I <laughs> like working with it so much. I would buy rolls of it. Like uh -huh. uh, you know, sort of just be a big like you know poster tube of that that stuff. And I used to keep the old like plastic um, tubes of you know just for whatever. Um, I don't know. It had a good smell. It was a little greasy. I don't know. It, I I like the stuff. Was it was it like a sticker sheet basically? Like a, um, so it was like sort of. If you you've worked with like screen tones before, adhesive yeah. and stuff. So it was not adhesive. Uh, but they you could buy like the, I think the first stuff I ever tried was adhesive. So it was mm -hmm. like a like a screen tone, but it was just red, right? A deep red, oh. and you stick it on. And I would I kept some of that stuff around for patching. But um, the stuff I bought the most of actually was like a two layer um, sheet of acetate mm -hmm. and you would cut through uh, and cut out the ruby lith, uh, the little pieces, um, but they would, you, you would retain like a full sh clear sheet underneath. So you were kind of peeling off a top layer and keeping the lower. Oh, layer. I see. Okay. So, so then it was it was on, yeah. So you'd submit that to the printer with your with the original art or something and then like that's another layer on top of it that yeah yeah and so you could do like uh you, you could do a ton like if you know if you were aware of like you know how to you know print if you wanted to do like say like a uh seven eight nine color silk screen poster or something like that or an offset print or something you could pile up that ruby lit but yeah. each time you you know unless you're you know shooting the screen yourself which takes time um if you're going to a printer that's like uh, a lot of money for every color you add. So I would, I was trying to like, you know, keep it minimal, keep the production costs down, especially, you know, cause I started out in self-publishing. So yeah. um, the, uh, um, I, and I was trying also, like I was interested in old comics anyway. So I was, I would get like, um, um, you know, dot shading and, and, and half tones, you know, screen tones actually, and then start layering them on top of each other to try and get the, you know, the whole range of colors. So I would, um, when I was self-publishing all of that stuff, uh, I would do like four color printing. Um, yeah. but, but I would, you know, I would, instead of like in what the real companies would do is if they were doing, they would do a ruby list thing for every color and then send that to the printer and then they would create the plates the four plates i, see. I would just send four layers so it would be like a black and white drawing on paper mm -hmm. and then a cyan layer magenta and a yellow layer um and each one would be like a mix of ruby lift and screen tone on this thing it was just this beautiful mass of like they, i think they look so cool i still like have them in a drawer and they look really neat because it's all red and black and 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 um transparent and um, they're neat and then they would just come back, you know, shot in color. And at first I was paying for even like the color proof or whatever, but then we, I found out you could, you could make your own by um, going, you know, going to a color Xerox and taking your, your, say what was going to be your cyan <laughs> and printing it in blue at a certain size and you would have reg marks too. So you, you know, you would register the whole thing while you're working on it. Uh -huh. So I'd line up the reg marks create my own sort of like, you know, color proof to go, okay, you know, this will work or this, you know, the brown is good or I got a bad, you know, like you can get a bad moray pattern. Like, yeah. You know, um, you know, there are good ones and bad ones. Like the good ones create a regular pattern on your eye and you're kind of like, that's comfortable. I can handle that. And the bad ones are like, you know, 60s op art where you're kind of like, it's really jarring and distracting. Yeah, that's the the scariest thing about that, with the screen tones is the moray patterns and, uh, I always felt like I, you know, because the last time I used it was my retrofit comic. I had some some uh, screen tones left, and I used it on that. And when it printed, because it because I just put it on the artwork of the actual size, so when it was shrunk down and printed, it became a moray pattern. 
And then I remember being at SPX with that comic and Jesse Recklock came by my table and like opened the comic and he was just like, oh, look at all this more. Oh my God. And I felt like super embarrassed. Like, oh, uh, like, <laughs> <laughs> it was too late i think i don't think yeah more is 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 good or bad i think it it it, it really it, it just depends on like you know the, there are bad ones you know it it's you know it's not it's not qualitative on its own i think you know i i i'm just always looking for the most pleasing ones and testing them out you know so when yeah. i was doing all of that um the sketchbook obama kind of books mm -hmm. the you know um those were all done with, you know, the, and printed at size. So I was always playing with the rotation of yeah. the, especially when overlapping, you know, um, patterns to make, you know, that make sure that I got, a, you know, really good looking ones that kind of drew the eye, but didn't like uh, overwhelm it. You know, and that's, that's what I was like, a, a crummy moray is going to overwhelm and distract from your art. But yeah. And, and, but then also when you're, you're describing like putting it up on a, at a larger size that you're working on and shrinking it down to a mini size mm -hmm. yeah it's just going to create a like a like a static yeah and then you scan it in because in the scanner doesn't know what the to do with the screen tone so it's like it just it, it's just chaos uh it's but yeah sometimes you can make it looks like a kaleidoscope or something like that you can make these beautiful patterns with it you know I, yeah i think so i think that's one of the cool things about it it's a little you know uh and if you get into like making digital ones it's it um it's more like you're you're coding there, you're inputting, you know, mm -hmm. rotation and and um, and line screen and stuff, so that it's uh, it's more guesswork actually. Like I prefer with that stuff, it's much more fun to be able to rotate freely because then yep. you can see the pattern yep. as you're as you're rotating. Go okay, that works because there's especially when you're doing color work, there are proper angles mm -hmm. um, to put on to to put half tone screens on top of each other. Uh, it's like you know. A, something like 15 degrees apart from each other or something like that. Uh, you uh, rotate 15 degrees and lay them on top of each other. And it should work out if they're like the same density. Anyway, yeah. this is stupid, who cares? I feel like I'm still, you know, now I'm adjusting to how, how easily you can distribute like images, you know, mm -hmm. um, electronically. And like you, you can do work that'll never see print. And I, you know, it's, you know, so you can use colors that you would never you you don't have to worry about them being printed like you know yeah. I, like I, I do a lot of work on you know uh in a program called clip studio mm -hmm. um and their color driver or whatever it is, is is just terrible like uh the the colors are just not they're not built for printing and, and there's no there's no good like uh cmyk slider or something to you know even mm -hmm. for me to like because i learned coloring in general before I learned Photoshop and all of that, like most of like most of the, you know, I learned it sort of by numbers. You know, it's like, oh, I know 20% of this, and you know, 40% of that color is going to give mm -hmm. me whatever. And so I just got used to like using those kind of input numbers. But there's nothing like this in this Clip Studio. But at the same time, they have all these like garish, like fluorescent, you know, just like kind of web colors that are just yes. sitting around the palette. I'm like, oh, these are kind of fun to draw with, even though. You could never print them. Yeah, uh, I'm not worried so much about printing anymore. Mm. Like, you know, or I could do a comic in pencil and just you know throw it on Instagram and people can still read it. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, like, it's it's just it's changed so much where like I used to only be concerned about you know what the the image I'm drawing it. How's it going to print? Like, is this is the ink line you know thick enough? You know, like, I mean, that's why we use ink anyway, is, mm -hmm. you know, all of that was just for, you know, plates and printing and, and you know, everything that an old timey cartoonist, you know, meaning like us or something, but yeah. I mean, you're a kid still, but yeah, I feel like you're born old. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, but, you know, every concern was about printing. Well, know? that's what screen tone is for. Screen tone is like, so you can have gray. Yeah, you know, trick the eye into thinking they're seeing gray, but they're not. You know. Yeah, or or even just like how much can you know? I do you like have like any old pages, or you've seen old pages where like there's all this paste up and glue and all this kind of oh yeah stuff going on, and and you nobody ever saw that on the printed page because it was mm -hmm. all you know like or like blue pencil, all these things that went into the fabrication of this page and the the original artwork just looks like a great bloody mess. You know, but the the other thing looked pristine. Oh, like a 
uh, Kaz original. I was amazed by how messy they were. They were just like, really, uh, almost like gross. They were, yeah, like very different from say like a like a Jaime original, which are like you know incredibly clean, you know, and almost like no mistake drawings and um, and the whole thing is very tidy. And I saw these Kaz pages and it, yeah, they just looked like they were filthy and got picked up off the floor and they had like glue and paste and you know all this stuff. And I was like, whoa, what a cool mess. I thought that they were like even better for being like super messy, but like there were underworld pages, I think, you know, underworld strips that he yeah. did for papers. And I was reading those anyway, and, and they always look super clean in print, mm -hmm. you know, so it was neat that they looked really messy in person. Yeah, it's interesting that we, uh, something happened where, so now we like fetishize that because like the artist editions come out and it's like all about just seeing yeah. all the, the process and like how fucked up the pages actually look and stuff like that. But you know, like, your recent books are already like artist editions basically because they're just scanned in like there's like no touch-ups or anything it's like if there was going to be like a steve weissman like a uh, uh, artist edition it would just be they would just reissue barack hussein obama and then yeah i just want to get it right the first time <laughs> yeah. well those yeah like that was so conscious also because you know the after spending whatever 10 years trying to make everything super clean Mm -hmm. you know, and, and fussing over that. I was like, what if we didn't, you know, scan in your art at like 600 DPI and sit there and clean it up for like weeks and then, you know, color it and blah, blah. It's like, what if you just took a picture of the thing, you know, do it all with no, no, no Photoshop and just like, you know, basically take a picture, you know, boost the contrast or something and then mm -hmm. get it out of there. You know, that was really fun because it was fun not to work on comics you know, on a computer for a bunch of years. Yeah. Are you, you have like the best story in Kramer's 10. And I was wondering is, did, is that electronic screen tone for that which, story? Which one is yeah, that? About the horse. I was wondering if that was also like a Laura Ingalls Wilder kind of a. Uh, oh yeah, it was uh, where they light the horse on fire. Yeah. Um, the, that was, I was reading a lot of, of Laura, a house on the prairie. I wanted to like. I wanted to write something kind of in that voice, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but uh, I, I'm glad you liked it. The the screen tone might have been digital, but there was like an ink wash too. Like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Like right after I did that comic, and I did like a lot of versions of it too. I drew it like a bunch of times. That was a really tough comic. Like, like just page count. I kept making it shorter and shorter and drew it and I wasn't happy like I, seriously there like I've got a stack of like the at least like three times trying to draw that like you know finished drawing not just oh. and, and just kept being unhappy with it and I think the final was I drew it in ink and then did ink wash and then I think a digital screen tone my guess is because, yeah, it would have been like a digital screen tone and some color, right? Yeah, there's one color, blue. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, was, I, could, I could tell, I was, well, I was like, anyway, like I, I was looking at like, did he switch to digital on this story? And like, uh, uh, oh, yeah, that was like, uh, I mean, I'd been working, you know, digital coloring for a long time, of course. But mm -hmm. uh, after I did that story, I was like, I need, I was, that was the last comic I drew with a brush. And I started. Oh. You know, uh, actually drawing just in a like uh, with a Cintiq after that because I just wasn't like it was driving me so crazy I was like I need a break from that that tool and I don't think I've drawn like a comic with a brush since that no kidding wow but you you don't do the sketchbook work anymore with the screen tones uh no I mean I mean I'm drawing a sketchbooks all the time but uh I'm yeah, I have, I'm not doing that. No, I'm not doing anything with screen tones now. Uh, so I'm doing like a, right now I'm working on like kind of a Western comic that's uh, just pencil and wash. Um, oh. I'm not 100% happy with how that looks. And I'm doing other stuff using Clip Studio, which I might use some screen tone, uh, just because I at this point I just, it's like a texture. Mm -hmm. um, yeah that your stuff just come, looks so natural. Yeah, like, mm -hmm. so I, it's interesting that the coloring technique is to enhance that kind of warmth and richness to it. Yeah, like, exactly. And are you, like, what are you drawing with? Uh, rapidographs, um, occasionally uh, microns if the rapidograph is getting really fussy. Like today I had to draw 
and and I was sitting. I actually I drew in a coffee shop today. I just brought some pages there, and I was trying to use this rapidograph, and it, I was it was just pissing me off. So that I'll switch to a micron, <laughs> just to. Just yeah, to I never uh, like rapidographs, but uh, uh, um, but that's cool. Yeah, of course, I should have guessed that that it was it's. Yeah, your your sort of grasp of like you know wood trees, you know uh, like nature, like. It it feels like genuine, you know, and and oh wow, thank you. I totally envy that when I see like like the uh, was it the Johnny Appleseed? Yeah, book? that's right. Like yeah, yeah. reading that, going like, oh my god, like the way you fill the pages is just like really exciting. You know what that was though? That was because I was drawing that book when I was at I had I had a fellowship at CCS, and um, Steve Vermont, Bissett, right? yeah, Steve Bissett was there, and he okay. you know he's like the Swamp Thing guy. Sure. And he gave a class on how to draw nature. And I, I just sat in on that class because I, I knew I was going to work on this Johnny Appleseed book. And he was just like, he said all this stuff that like had never occurred to me about drawing nature. Or he's just like, you know, a lot of people, a lot of artists will draw trees where they're just like sticks standing up in the ground. He's like, you, you understand that like nature is a war that's happening like all around you. So like you need to make sure that you're like portraying that. That's a storyline that's happening behind your artwork. Like, Meanwhile, these trees are fighting for space, you know, and there's vines crawling up them, trying to choke them out and all this stuff. And I had never thought about it like that before. And then since the school is kind of around nature, I would go out with my sketchbook and just draw, you know, just like examples of what trees were, were doing to each other and stuff like that. And then pop those in the background of the pages. Right. I think a lot of cartoonists, like they draw one leaf. You know, there's like one kind of leaf and there's one kind of grass and there's one kind of flower. And I, I mean, I've certainly like, I've been so guilty of that, but like yeah. when I, you know, you, if you look, usually it's not nature that tells me that it's like other artists that I'm just like, wait, this, you know, this artist is drawing like several different kind of, I yeah. think we might've been like Ron Rigi was one of the first people I'd noticed where like, you know, cause he would draw so many like, you know, idyllic like you know scenes in a in in a in a field or something like that and um he was he was drawing like cypress trees and i was like oh yeah like they don't all have to be one stupid cloud shape you know <laughs> yeah yeah but it's also interesting like i always feel like i need to relearn how to draw trees because i get influenced by like if i'm reading chris ware's comics or something it's like he does the circle with like the little triangles coming off of it all around that circle and you go like, oh, all right, well, that's another way I could do it. And that seems like it's simpler. So I'm always, it's like, a, it's like an ongoing process. Like what's the best way to get this done? Some artist, yeah. Igor, you know, the Italian artist? Yeah, but I can't picture the art now. His drawings, it'll be like a tree. He'll do the shape of a tree and then he'll only just put extra lines on one side of it. Like the, whatever side has the shadow on it. Oh, okay. And that's a pretty good way of doing it too. So like whenever I have to draw nature, I'm always like, uh, going through the Rolodex in my head of like, which artist I feel like ripping off for this, yeah, for this yeah. tree. I mean, ideally, you know, we, we just, you know, go figure out like, yeah, go draw some trees. Like maybe Steve Bissett is saying, <laughs> yeah. and, then, and then try and just shorthand it, you know, like that, like, um, uh, like the old cartoonist trick of like drawing things several times, you know, to like, you know, reduce it, you know, down to its simplest essence, you know, something I like, I tell kids all the time. It's just like, don't, don't draw anything for the first time on your in your comic panel, you huh. know. Like, yeah, you know, practice that. Like, if you're going to introduce like an environmental, you know, um, uh, um, element or a prop or a costume, something, you know, like just you know, at least draw it a couple times in your sketchbook so you can kind of it fits on the page with the character that you've drawn a hundred times, you know, because there's that thing where like if you if you you know. Like, I don't even think like when you're doing the comic, I, you know, I tend not to think of that as drawing. It's just sort of like, you know, that cartooning is different. Like drawing is trying to figure your shit out. And then cartooning is really just communicating, you know, visual ideas. Yeah, you, you, so you teach comics? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I've taught like in youth uh, classes for a really long time, like uh, maybe like 14, 15 years or something. Uh -huh. um, and then I also, I, I teach uh, like, uh, like a college level class at the art center. Um, and that's been for like the last year or so. But, uh, and we actually, yeah, we just have like finals. This is finals week. Oh, so we're just getting, we're just finishing off everything this week. So I had one this morning with some 
students. And yeah, I don't know. It's it's cool. Like, but talking to like older, you know, the older they get, like the you know, they're way more sophisticated. So, mm -hmm. uh, but I yeah, with kids, I'm always trying to kind of like be able to articulate, you know, what we're trying to do at the you know at the simplest level. Mm -hmm. So yeah, like I'll I'll say a lot of things really like oh, I'll oversimplify like all uh -huh. the time. Are you, uh, do you do any work for like any uh, cartoon shows or anything like that in Hollywood? Oh, you mean like animation stuff? Yeah. Not in a lot. I was never like at a studio or anything, but I've done like, um, um, like freelance work and development stuff and whatever. That was like, uh, when we first moved to town, I was totally into that idea. Um, mm -hmm. And also we had a young kid. So I was like, kind of my brain was pointed in that way. Yeah. Um, now my son is like 19 like so i don't really care about that stuff anymore because i don't watch <laughs> like those things, you yeah. know yeah um and i'm not really compelled to be in that so it's not really like everyone in town here like has worked in it in some way or another you know mm -hmm. if you're if you're here long enough you'll you'll do that kind of thing i do you do you still do stinkers is that still a, a project with matt's oh yeah 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 um yeah we've always got some kind of thing going like i we just uh, lately, we were doing some reprints. Um, we reprinted like a Matt Fury thing was really fun. Yeah, I, I usually do like one or two designs a year mm -hmm. for myself and Matt. He's, he's pretty prolific and he's kind of similar. This last year, even though like the stinkers are doing fine, you know, we, you know, we're selling them still all over the place, but um, I haven't done a design since uh i think since 2019 because last year really sucked for me yeah like yeah, yeah. i had a bad year everyone had a bad year but uh um yeah mine was mine was horrible and so like this year is all about kind of like trying to get back on track so i'm like okay i'm gonna get i'm gonna get this design going it'll be fun because doing you know like usually we used to do like nine sticker sets uh each like artist would do like a sheet of nine nine designs that would fit together on a sheet um i don't know how much you know about like is, I've only okay. seen them kind of just like online, right? I've never seen them in the wild. <laughs> so, I, you know. yeah, yeah. I don't think we're represented in South Carolina. No, uh, but uh, like, like these are some. These are the oh, ones yeah. people did, um, <laughs> and uh, gosh, oh yeah, here's some good ones with Matt. So, I think yeah, he just reprinted this. Um, that's a great Matt's design. Hmm. I love like this guy here. Um, he's kind of a, like a, a great little mascot. Um, and the kid with the bubble gum. Matt's is great at grotesques. It's funny because like we're really good friends. Um, but like when we were like, um, uh, yeah, when we were starting out, like he was like, I, all my stuff was like really cute and his stuff was like, really, really gross. It was like, <laughs> I thought it was a good combination. Yeah. Um, here's one I did. Yeah, this is I think the last one I did before uh, the pandemic. This was this was a pretty fun one, you know, trying to get um, uh, trying to like have a consistent background, mm. uh, you know, where it runs across like nine uh, nine stickers, but um, you know they can be chopped down and each be each becomes its own sticker. So uh, it was fun. I would say like some of these. Oh yeah. It's even got like some, speaking of like finding ways to rip people off, I think some of these leaves were like influenced by you. <laughs> See those little ones? Those yeah. Are, like, they're like ugly, right? <laughs> That's amazing. Who handles like the business side of, of that? You do? I mean, that seems like a full-time job running that. It's not a full-time job. It's, it's, it's like, I think of it as like a, it's like one, depending on how things are going, it's like one to two days, you know, okay. of, of focusing on that kind of stuff. Like, it's like being in publishing a little bit. That's the only way I'm kind of like in my own, like, you know, as a, as a publisher, like I got out of self-publishing, you know, a hundred years ago. Like I didn't like that. It was kind of um, punishing, you know, for the, you know, for your soul. Like, it just makes you feel bad all the time. <laughs> You know, you, you're constantly trying to talk people into like buying your shit, you know, and that's not for me. Yeah. But like working on stickers with friends, you know, where I'm not just selling my stuff, I'm selling 
you know, people's artwork I love. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not, I'm never having to talk people into it either. You know, mm -hmm. like, you know, I don't know. It's stickers are a real easy sell. So, yeah. you know, everyone likes them and we just, you know, the project is just kind of self-sustaining. We make money, we just pour it back into the project. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how it's been working. And we'll see like someone that whose art we like that we think would look cool on a sticker you know it it's sort of like this thing where we go like oh that person because there's loads of people that would think oh these you know these people are great but um it's not like how's it going to compete against a wacky pack or something like that <laughs> um we when we were first starting we, we you know we would just work with like we were working with illustrators and all kinds of people were like oh we just think their work is so cool mm -hmm. um but they wouldn't we wouldn't sell any of their stickers because it's just like it's not it doesn't pop out. It's not like bubble gumming it up. You really have to like, so we mostly like work with people who are like that their work is like really neat, but it's also like high contrast and it's funny or whatever it is that like people are going to go, oh my God, I want to like, I have to get that sticker or something like that. Yeah. Like you worked with Johnny Ryan, I think, right? Did oh my God. He was like the best at it. He, like everything he did, of course, he's like so funny and high contrast anyway. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we made a lot, <clears throat> a lot of stickers with him, like, you know, scary ones and funny ones. And yeah, those are some of the best ones we ever did. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh gosh we did some ones with jaime last year um oh that's a good one yeah like the wrestlers uh yeah that was something i was bugging him for years i was like you know they could be like wrestler trading cards you know and mm -hmm. like i don't know man anyway like uh finally he relented uh we did some cool protest ones with jordan crane last oh, year yeah. yeah i do like the billing and the distribution mm -hmm. and and you know, like about half the outreach, and then Matt's does the printing, and about um, uh, about half the outreach, you know, too. You know, when we work together, we just kind of like uh, it's a fun thing because we're like really good friends from way back, and mm -hmm. we live in different cities, so we get to kind of like um, you know, we're talking to you know all the time about this stuff. So it's yeah. a way of like that's part of it too. It's just like let's do something, you know, because it's fun to work together. Mm -hmm. So you, you only have one kid, you have a son? Yeah. Um, yeah, he, he's in college, but like he's been like for the last like few, this term he's been doing it from here, you know, just because you can, so you mm -hmm. can. but he's enrolled currently like in school in Montana. Oh, okay. And what, where was your career at But when, when you found out you're gonna be a father? Uh, it was about to end. <laughs> <laughs> was it? <laughs> you were just doing books for fanographics at the time or uh, had I done a book for fanograph I think I yeah I I had like I think I had a book or two with fanographics no yeah I mean things uh I yeah did, having a kid definitely like you know it it fucks up your momentum especially if you know you're not like the the main breadwinner which I've never been mm -hmm. um so yeah like I was the sort of the primary like you know the first on call you know, for childcare, mm -hmm. in like those. So yeah, it it really like um, you're like at least for me, like my my comics career became like way less important when I had like a kid, just because like you know you you got to be focused on something else. Yeah. So yeah, it definitely like changed the way like I could you know the amount of time I could worry about something like comics. You know, it, it put it in like. Uh, yeah, like uh, higher relief, you know, like, you know, so uh, yeah, my career kind of ended. Did you take some, like a few months off uh, to just be with the kid and then just try and get any illustration work because it was paying? Mm, uh, no, like, I, I mean, it ended up being like a couple of years, you know, because like oh, okay. you just take a couple of months off with a kid, you know, <laughs> so, like they're not even walking after a couple of months. So yeah, yeah. like um, you like, or me, I, um, yeah, just you, I was doing work the whole time, but it just really slowed during mm. that period. So like having a baby, like I was still, during that whole period, I was working for like tech magazines doing like illustration work. And that was, it was pretty undemanding. Like uh, it was easy enough to like, you know, when my wife had a break, I could go work for a couple hours and, and, and get an illustration done. That was no big deal. Mm. Um, doing comics is way harder than illustration. Yeah. You, know, you need that sustained period of, of quiet. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that period of time was like really tough for comics. I know I did like, 
I did finish that. There's the book White Flower Day. I think I finished that book uh, within that period of when Charles was like an infant, but it was really hard. It was like tough doing like anything more than a couple of pages. Yeah, I'm because I'm having a kid and um, a son in September. So I'm like, <laughs> so now I'm like talking to all these other cartoonists who, who have been through this. Yeah, you're, you're young I'm, yet. So. I'm 36. Um, I'll, okay. be, I'll be 37 in July. So I think right. about it at night. I think like I'll be in my 50s when the kid is this old. Yeah. <laughs> it's fun. Like, I was really nervous about having a boy when I found out because I mm -hmm. thought like I'm a terrible male role model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Me too. Yeah, I feel the same way. Yeah. That's like imposter syndrome. You're like, I can't, a dad, no way, man. I can't be that guy. But I ended up being kind of like, I, you know, was like a little league coach. And oh, okay. It was a ball. I really liked it. It was fun. Like, I liked having like a boy, even mm -hmm. though I was really nervous about it. Um, it was, it was just fun, you know, to kind of like wrestle around with someone. And, um, well, did it help your comics at all? Because your, your characters were all children at the time? The Yike stuff was never really about kids. It, yeah. You know, it was about, it was about it was about me anyway but um the i would say that like the comics i used to when i used to draw for nickelodeon mm -hmm. um, you know when that magazine was still going yeah that like was helped by having a kid because you know then he sort of grew into that demographic of a kid who would read nickelodeon magazine so mm -hmm. you could not only could i bounce ideas off them i think i sold them a few things that like a more or less developed by talking to him, you know what I mean? Oh, good. So like, you know- Got we him had, working early. Yeah, but or not even, him, just like, you know, sometimes I would just kind of go like, you know, I'd be talking to him and, you know, he, there would be like a funny interaction, be like, oh, we can, you know, build on that, you know? But I, I know like one, there was one like really funny comic that I liked where um, he used to dress up in costumes all the time when he was a kid. He was always making like some new costume, like, and, uh, he was putting on one and he he called himself like Eagle Man or something. Mm -hmm. I was like, and I kept asking him questions, you know, just you, you interview kids, you know, like you're just like, well, what are you doing? You know, or interrogate them or whatever it is, you know? So like, I was just asking him about like what he was, you know, who was this, what's the deal with this character? And he kept giving me the, you know, like just the first answer he could think of, I'm guessing, because they were just like sort of nonsense answers, but they're, <laughs> you're seeing like the gears grind. Uh, and, and I ended up, making this comic uh that ran in the magazine that was like um these these superheroes show up at a crime scene and the crowd just starts asking them questions you know because he, uh, he was like a superhero and the crowd's like hey you know what who are you supposed to be and like the guy's like i'm eagle man he's like well where's the eagle and he's like it's at home <laughs> you know, whatever like your kids would say so it was just like basically you know not verbatim but more or less me you know asking questions to like you know, a seven-year-old, and then and then putting them in the mouths of a superhero. Yeah. Was there a time, like in the late '90s, uh, where you were able to make a living from your work? Like, is it you? It seemed like you know, like I, that just reminded me of like how you did like mini Marvels, like the little superhero. Like, was that paying enough that you could live on? Uh, I think if you, if you can, if you're together enough to string, you know, all of that stuff, you know, together in short order. Yeah, you'd have like good months and bad months, but I've I've, you know, I've never been able to like, just on like freelance cartooning, nah. Like, yeah. but, I, but I'm also like not, you know, I'm, I'm a little lazy, I'm not super ambitious, you know? Um, <laughs> and, you know I'm, a, I'm a mess, like I'm not a good example of like a professional person, even though like, I don't know, I'm kind of keeping my shit together, but. You have um, tons of books out and, and you run a sticker company. <laughs> Your company i got it all together and yeah I'm, yeah yeah it seems like it's going I, all right i think on paper i like i like i like my life you know just fine um mm -hmm. but i'm not i've never been like you know, except for when i was starting out you're like can you make a living at this you know like every every cartoonist is starting like can we do this and like you know buy a house or something and it's like the answer is no you can <laughs> um i think I, I have to ask this question i think i already know the answer to it though or i can guess what the, be the answer is but what do you think was like the best point of your career so far mm -hmm. You know, I don't know. I think I know just by doing a, a Stephen Weissman Google search. Okay. I can tell that it was 2012 was the best year for you uh, career wise. Because wait, 2012, that was like an Obama book? 
dude, that you got so much press for that book. <laughs> like, holy shit. Well, like almost yeah. everything on the internet related to you has to do with that book. I was like, damn, this is Steven's like glory days. Smart title, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, as soon as I thought of that idea, it's like, I, I was like, yeah, the, oh, I mean, I, every idea I have, I'm like, oh, this one can't miss. You know, like, so, you know, I have an idea, like, oh, that's a good idea. Oh, you should definitely call a comic like Barack Hussein Obama. Like, you, you know, people who love him, like, who, everyone's going to have a reaction. That's like 100%. You're going to have, yeah. a, you're going to get a reaction off that title. Um, and I know, like, uh, I think a lot of people were just sort of, eventually they were just perplexed, you know, because they would, you know, they went to that thing to take a look and they're like, wait, what is it about, you know? <laughs> that was going to be like a real biography. <laughs> yeah, like, I, I still couldn't, I couldn't, you know, I could not, like, as much as I would love to try and not be myself or, no, I wouldn't, you know, like, you know, I end up writing about the same things anyway, just the stuff that is, you know, is interesting or amusing to me, so, which is like, I think, pretty like as a pretty narrow audience but you mm -hmm. know i also have like an impulse to go like oh wouldn't it be great to do something that like has a big impact on you know and and you know gets a lot of eyeballs and that yeah that just using him as a character which is a stupid idea anyway but i think especially the best part was just calling it barack hussein obama uh -huh. just, you, know, you, you know uh was definitely going to like get someone's attention yeah it i guess it worked i don't know if there was an especially great time or anything that was around the time i met you i think yeah because i had my book i did like an abraham lincoln book for fanographics so, so we had the two year the do you remember yeah. feeling like it was it was like a like you were getting like a, like especially more interviews or anything like that around that time yeah yeah because i was like i was on the you know like the radio and um mm -hmm. and uh yeah, the, I guess the, and it was a presidential year. Yeah, the whole thing was kind of smart, you know, like, it, yeah. you know, it worked out. And then we did a second book for 2016, but it didn't have his name in the title. And I think it, it hurt it, even though the book was better. Um, and I thought like the second book was called Looking for America's Dog. Mm -hmm. I thought that title, that's gonna be the, I, I don't know why, like, you know, or I'll have these ones where I think, oh, that's like a great, you know, like I want to give a book kind of like, like an aspirational sound. So I thought like, oh, that would, you know, this is the kind of thing that someone will, you know, go like, hey, maybe I'm looking for America's dog or, you know, they should have like, I want to have book titles that are centered maybe around like physical fitness or, you know, losing weight or a better sex life or something. I should do that, you know, um, next time I want to get eyeballs. But the thing, I, what happens to me like every time, Noah, mm -hmm. like I get some attention is I never know what to do with it, you know? Uh -huh. Like I, I get a little like interest and it's just like, I'm, you know, like you're talking to me, it's just like, I really, have, I have no idea like where I want to take people. I just, you know, I'm just trying to like amuse myself. Yeah. What? Cause your social media is kind of like that too, where you're, you don't really have it. Are you on Twitter still or did you get rid of Twitter? I'm not on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. I like it. Uh -huh. But if you got over a certain amount of followers, you think you would be like, I got to get out of here. This is too much for me. No, uh, I think I'm like well adjusted enough that I could handle that, but I don't, I don't think I would, um, like I used to wonder when I was younger, like, uh, um, like, especially around the time we moved down to this area, it was like, uh, like I had a sense of myself as being kind of like a marginal figure mm -hmm. and I wasn't sure if I was marginal because of, um, where, where I lived, you know, like that I wasn't just, you know, I wasn't in anyone's way. You know, I'm not like super vocal um, or if it was really just a case of like my um, my aesthetic and personality and, and my work basically made me marginal. And I didn't know what that answer was at the time, you know, and so I, I moved here and plunked myself down in everyone's way. Um, and uh, and it, it was it has been like really helpful to me, you know, like I've, I've moved along. Um, but I realized, oh yeah, no, I'm not the guy with the Mickey Mouse idea that's gonna, you know, I'm not gonna be like the center of any, any uh, like attention. So I am a marginal figure because I think um, I, my work appeals to a small number of people. So I can't even imagine, you know, um, having like a hundred thousand people following. Yeah. They, they just wouldn't do it. It wouldn't, I don't think it would make me super uncomfortable. I just think they, I, I know, 
that my work couldn't possibly interest that many people. Yeah, I've I've come to like a similar conclusion about myself where I'm like, okay, I'm not, you know, I, I never was like a Michael DeForge super hip cartoonist. I'm not gonna have a book like Emil Ferris's hit. I'm not gonna do like a hit book. If I have any no notoriety in my life, it'll be from volume because I put out so much work. But um, what matters to me is not, and you know, in, in my younger days, I would have been like, what matters to me is uh, that I do work that outlasts my life. But at this point, I think I just want to create work that helps me live mm -hmm. while I'm here. And when I'm gone, I really don't care if it all just disappears and everybody forgets about me. Like that doesn't matter. It's only to decorate my life, you know? And that's like what interests me about my work at this point. Like I don't, it doesn't matter, you know? I don't need a legacy. All this right. stuff can go away, it doesn't matter. It's just about, it's just about helping me out while I'm alive, you know? Yeah, and also having fun, right? Oh, I mean, that's what it is, that, that's what it's all about. Like it, it, like I always feel really fortunate because I know there are a lot of people who don't have a direction or passion or like, you know, they don't even know why they're alive. And I feel really fortunate that I've never had that. I've always yeah. been like, like cartooning has always kind of given me that. Even when I was a kid, I, 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 I basically was always a cartoonist. Like I always drew and all that stuff. So I feel like I was kind of born into something, <laughs> like born into a calling or something. And, and I'm just, I've just been going along on that road with that. And I'm yeah, I can, see that. I can see that in you for sure. And I know I've had that similar, like that, that similar feeling of like, you know, it'd be great. Like, it doesn't seem like a, a curse to be like, um, or never like sounded like that to me, like to be well loved in your lifetime and forgotten immediately after you die. That seems like that's a that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, like some uh, some icon for people to like, uh, you know, for future generation. Like, what are you going to care for one? But also, like, you know, uh, you know, icons get smashed anyway. So like, that's true. Why would you want for people to revere and hate you? You know, like uh -huh. for the next few years. I mean, I want the um, the same way, like you know, your your grandparents live on, and you like I I want to live on, you know, in in that sort of like mm -hmm. <laughs> I guess the old like sort of Jewish idea of just like you know that we have a line going, and it and it means something. Um, I didn't really appreciate that when I was younger, mm -hmm. but I see it now that like most of like most of who you are is like uh, it's kind of you know genetics and math you know it's just like it's all physical stuff there's not a lot of like I don't know I don't see a lot of magic in the world you know it, it, yeah. it just seems like it's it's pretty much just it's it's stuff and like and most of your stuff comes from you know it's it's modified by environment but it's mostly just like all the shit you're born with yeah well I I kind of answered that question for you but I still want to know like if you if somebody had like a time machine where you could just go back and drop in on a specific point of your career uh, what would it be? I, I yeah, I don't, uh, I don't know what the answer to that is. I, I was paying attention kind of the whole time. So I don't feel like I, you know, like I remember those things pretty well. So it's not like, there's nothing I need to relive, I guess, you know, like, I think, you know, it's funny because, uh, and I don't know if this may not even answer the question, but like, you know, like so much happens in comics right when you get there. Mm. Um, so like, I think the first five years are really interesting in any like professional cartoons career because um, definitely like, like I wouldn't have, it seems like such a short amount of time for me to like go from like, you know, self-publishing to like doing books with like Fantagraphics, which was my main ambition, you mm -hmm. know, when I was starting out, like I, when I was a kid, I thought, oh, I could do, I could work for something like Marvel. Wouldn't that be the best thing in the world? And I mean, that happened too, you know, like, so everything that I kind of, all of my ambitions in comics were fulfilled in the first five years of working in comics. Um, and then the rest of the time, it's just like, oh, well, how do I keep, how do I keep working in comics? But, you know, so, um, you know, a lot of stuff happened in that little first burst, mm -hmm. but it's not like, it's not like it's worth, yeah, there's nothing there for me to visit you know not like the work doesn't even seem that interesting that i was doing like hmm. there, are little, there are little bits when i like because i'm old enough now to go like oh you know that was that was that's not a bad like page of comics for you know a kid in his 20s you know 
because yeah. most of them are usually are kind of like you don't know what you're doing like i you know i barely know how to construct you know i'm just sort of like looking at everyone else's comics you know and like and even just discovering stuff that you should even know about like i remember someone i'd never read a little lulu comic until like someone compared my comics to little lulu and i was like mm -hmm. I was like, well, Little Lulu must be pretty good. So let me check it out. I'm like, holy shit, it's really good. <laughs> yeah. Way better than I could ever be. And like, you know, it's been like a textbook for the rest of my life. It's like, oh, how would, you know, how did John Stanley, you know, like do this, you know? Yeah. But, you know, just stuff you should know, but you don't know. Well, that's interesting. I think you're right about that. Like the beginning, the first five years are kind of special because you don't know what the reality of what you're involved is really. Like, like the idea of being a fan of graphics artist and striving to do that, like it was like really magical to me. Like it was uh -huh. like, you know, like, oh my gosh, like I got an email. I remember opening my email and seeing a, a message from Eric Reynolds for the first time and being like, oh, like it's Eric Reynolds. Like, oh my, you know, <laughs> holy shit. And like that, how fun that actually is like that, uh, you know, or like I remember going to um, a convention for the first time where people were who I, I'd only read their work. I never met them or anything. Yeah. And I remember when Dan Klaus, I only knew what he looked like from, if you Googled his name, it would be like just this little black and white photo of him that somebody must have scanned in that was like on a dust jacket of one of his early Lloyd Llewellyn books or something. So like, it just seemed, he seemed really mysterious to me at that time. Like who is, uh -huh. who is Dan Klaus? And I, he, you know, there was like, no, he wasn't on any Webs, you know, he wasn't on MySpace or anything, <laughs> you know, like just the mystery about what this whole world of comics was. And I still kind of uh, like worship the books that were coming out around that era the most, because those were the books that I was getting from the library at the time and reading on the bus on the way to work, you know, when I was like still new to, I was kind of educating myself about comics. Right. Um, like there's a Grant Geisman um, book on EC comics. That like covers every artist basically boils down every artist and like what you know and then we'll give like an example of one of their books that, or one of the stories they did in ec okay. and i read that that was my introduction to ec comics and at the time it was like i got into comics i felt like you need to know all of these things and you need to know all these artists if you're going to be involved in this like you need to like build up some kind of foundation so i was kind of scrambling to learn everything i could like i wanted to know about carl barks but like where was i going to read carl barks right you know like all these like little things like oh i need to well crumb says that him and his brother read you know like john stanley's little lulu so like how am i going to find how to you know i got to find that stuff now and everything and i gotta know I about the new york dinner and like they're going to ask me what i think of graham angles and i don't have an answer <laughs> <laughs> yeah. gotta have an opinion about this stuff and it kind of was like that because one time i was at a cartoonist dinner that i should not have been at i was nobody knew who i was and i was seated across from dan nadell and I just felt like a little baby next to these guys who were like having these like serious discussions about like Al Hartley or something. And I was like, oh, <laughs> tell me what you're in the bathroom. Yeah, like trying to like, I still, but I still wanted to make like some kind of an impression on this conversation. Cause these guys I felt like were really cool in the industry. And like, you know, like, a, but I had no, I had nothing of value to, to add. So it's like, it's, it, yeah. But I think also yeah, that's the fun of it. Yeah, I, I think that's like a very common experience for people who are entering like the mm -hmm. field is that you, you know, you show up and like, for the most part, like, um, you know, if, if you're any good, people just like, they're like, Hey, Oh, you're in the gang now. Um, you know, it, in one sense or another, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't remember making a lot of enemies in the first five years, you yeah. know, maybe four or five, but like, you know, it, it was like, it was, it was, that was a minor deal. It was m more just a case of like, you know, here, here are the people that you're going to be friends with because, you know, like there were people that were older, you know, when I got into it, but, you know, and also like it was part of it was nice. It was being introduced to the people who were my age, you know, also mm -hmm. like I think the first time I went to like a convention, I think I you know, basically met everybody, but it was funny. I was at like a last gas party or something like that. And, uh, and maybe I was meeting Klaus for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, but he, you know, like I've always was really like aware, even with like Jaime, who's like one of my best friends, like now, like I was really like trying to be aware of not like uh, trying to cross that barrier, you know, of, of what I perceive as a mentor versus yeah. a friend, you know, like the people who came before me, I, I looked at these people like they're, you know, they're like teachers or mentors in an, in an informal setting, you know, 
um, not like a like a, an official mentorship or anything, but you know, there, there's like a barrier. So I was, you know, aware of not wanting to monopolize some, someone's time. So, um, but he like Klaus was really like you know pretty generous person to young artists. Mm -hmm. You know, he was he was thoughtful. Bag was the same way too, um, but uh, I was talking to him at this party and try not to be a pain in the ass. And and he's like, you know, you should meet. Sam Henderson, uh, and he like, he grabs like Sam Henderson, he's like, you two should talk to each other. And at first I was like, oh, he's giving me the brush up. That's, but that was a nice way of doing it. And then like Sam and I were friends for years and years after that. And, and I think um, he was right. I should have been talking to, you know, I, but he was basically telling me like, you should meet the people that, you know, are your age, you know, yeah. that you be like, you know, forming like you know some some new friendships with and I was like oh I really appreciated that it was great and were there a lot of artists that you met back then um who were like your contemporaries who just kind of vanished like they just stopped doing comics and just disappeared from your life uh yeah probably um I mean a lot of people I don't like I'm not really great at keeping up long distance mm -hmm. friendships even though I consider the you know these people like my friends but like like when Henderson, he used to live in Los Angeles when I moved here. He oh. moved away, uh, and he's back in Woodstock. Mm -hmm. um, like, yeah, once once people are out of my my my, if I can't walk to their house, I you know like I'm not going to be friends <laughs> for very long. So they kind of vanished from my life anyway. I'm sure people have stopped doing comics, but I don't go to the comic store, so I don't really like. I'm not sure who's doing comics and not doing comics. There's no like. I'm doing them, you know, and the, and I have a, I'm lucky enough to live within walking distance of a, you know, like a number of great cartoonists who are also like my pals. So like, yeah. um, you know, I can walk up the street that way and go talk to like, you know, uh, Vanessa Davis and Trevor Alexopoulos. I can, you know, walk over this way and Jaime lives, you know, nearby and Jordan Crane lives nearby and, you know, um, or I can go to the beach with like, uh, like Craig Thompson lives in LA, you oh, know, okay. like, um, we've been having like a, a sort of like surfboarding club with like Craig Thompson and AJ Dungo and, and Jordan even comes along to those. It's fun. Like, you know, it's like all these people around. So like, those are the, like in general, if someone lives in my town or neighborhood, I'll like, um, those are the people I end up hanging out with, you know. You, uh, when you work with Fantagraphics, you design your own books? Uh, I like, I'm active in the process, but I, I'm always working with the designer because there, there, there's a lot about design that I'm not comfortable with. Like, you know, um, like I've never been really good with type. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, spine width and stuff like that is beyond me, but. Yeah. Uh, right. uh, I'm either like working with, like mostly at Fantagraphics, I've worked with Jacob. Um, oh, yeah. And then when I haven't been, like I, you know, I'll, I'll lean on friends. Like Jordan's a great friend to have when I have like a, if, if I've got a question about design and, and time to listen to his answer, like he's a great guy to talk to. <laughs> he really helped me a lot, like, you know, um, with that, like looking for America's dog. Like I was just, have, I was like having a really frustrating time trying to like get it where I wanted it. And he's like, all right, let's spend a day doing it. And uh, yeah. I don't know if you ever have like a, you have trouble getting to sleep ever? Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I had like sleeping strategy of just kind of like um, telling myself like a shaggy dog story hmm. like every night and like um, and it and making it like boring and stupid, you know, like so I had one going for like months that was like about the 1970s like superhero group the champions, which is like a Marvel thing mm -hmm. of like sub defenders like it was like this is like the, the, no one wanted these guys on the team. It was like Angel, Iceman, Hercules, you know, like the Black Widow and Ghost Rider. Uh, it was just, they were hopeless. <clears throat> but I, like when I started reading comics, like my brother had a couple of issues of it, in my older brother. And so I, I'd read them and I was like, I wonder what if that, you know, and I'd only read a couple of issues and I kind of wondered if it was any good. Uh, and I think the answer is no. But just my sleeping strategy for this period was to, just kind of imagine what my version of that would be and like, what would happen next? So every night I would just kind of think, what if they were like, um, cause they were like a LA super team, uh, which was like, never works for a Marvel comic either. Cause everything has to be in like New York. Yeah. So I was like, well, 
you know, if they're in LA, they should live out like by the beach. And I don't know, it's just like every night I would kind of think what happens next until I fell asleep, you know? Um, and it would last a little while and I ended up doing like, I was like, oh, you know, I haven't, I did it long enough that I was like, there's kind of a story there. I could do like a little bit of this as a comic. So I did like a, a small zine and I, I will totally send you one. Yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, when I got them printed, um, this was cool. Like the, the printer just sends them with like a, uh, with a, just a paper cover. Yeah. so that they, they don't rub all over each other oh okay and it, it was great because yeah you're right those things like the ink would start coming off immediately so if they printed these and piled the books on top of each other each book would be fucked up and ruined uh -huh. uh, sometimes like they would maybe they would put like a, a sheet of paper in between but this one they just like when they were uh collating and and stapling they just put a piece of paper on every single one of them before they would trim or anything Yikes, I hope I gave you something worth putting on your YouTube channel.